And let me just ask this question. Like, do you really trust Wall Street? Like, do you think, oh, these are the upstanding citizens of the world? Do you know, if they open a daycare, would you send your kids to them? Hell no, because you go pick them up, they'd be like, sorry, we lost 8% of little Johnny today, but uh, toes grow back, right? Okay, did a few reaction videos with Dave Ramsey. I just gotta keep doing them. There's just more, I, I can't believe what I found on the last two that were sent to me. So send in ones you want me to react to, but let's take a little look at this one. Is this what you were sold mm -hmm. for a lack of vision? Mm -hmm. The people perish. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not making fun of you, I'm just saying I told you so. And, and so you've got to learn these lessons. Part of maturity is being able to look past what's going on and take what looks like a disaster and say it is temporary. Yes. It is temporary. Yeah. It is temporary. So basically saying, hey, things are not going well in the stock market, but just look past it. It looks bad, but it's not bad. That's just a, you know, what I'm getting from the first part of this. It is temporary. It could take two years to come back. It could take two months to come back. But will the pandemic completely destroy the U.S. economy is the logical, critical thinking skill you have to develop. Yeah, yeah I don't think it's going to completely destroy the economy, but I would say that because people automatically put money in the retirement plans and they're just funding the stock market, and we look at how many of these companies are you know, so overvalued that's why we see major drops when they happen, but then we print money or we just add to the economy to artificially hold this up. And the reality is the stock market did extraordinarily well in the 90s, but some people still think it's going to have those double digit returns moving forward. But I think it's just a kind of a pipe dream. I don't expect that to happen. And yeah, I don't think it's, imp you know, let's make rash decisions when there's things that drop and immediately go, oh, the sky's falling and everything's over. But it's a time to really check in and say, hey, how do I feel when the market goes down? Do I feel like I have any control? Do I know why it's going down? Do I know why it would come back up? Do I feel like I'm a good investor? Do I know the different stocks that I hold? Or do I know the manager that's in charge of them? Do I know the fees that I pay? Do they waive the fees when I lose money? The answer is no. Um, how long will it take to come back? Because let's say that you lose 10 percent one year on 100 grand you're not 90 grand well the next year they make 10 percent back but you only get 10 percent on 90 grand so it's only back to ninety nine thousand dollars and you've lost time value of money you've lost that time not just your money and what did it do to your mind during that time did you feel uh, you know depressed sad did it make you more angry did you more short with your family like you got to think about some of these other factors and think why is it that investing has become synonymous with stocks because that's what people are paid to sell. And let me just ask this question. Like, do you really trust Wall Street? Like, do you think, oh, these are the upstanding citizens of the world? You know, if they open a daycare, would you send your kids to them? Hell no, because you go pick them up, they'd be like, sorry, we lost 8% of little Johnny today, but uh, toes grow back, right? So I think it's time to ask critical questions. And when there's volatility, people start asking this, but why are stocks valued where they're valued is public perception. What are people willing to pay? Why are they willing to pay that? Well, a lot of times it's not because they've done analysis or they have critical knowledge about it and a lot of mutual funds have to stay involved in growth stocks even if they don't feel like it's a good time for growth stocks because that's the objective of the fund and if they go against it they get sued and they have legal ramifications so uh just a couple notions there and we haven't even really gotten the video it's a hundred percent back as of tuesday the s p 500 closes at a record erasing last of pandemic losses Wall Street clawed back the last of the historic frenzied losses unleashed by the coronavirus as the S&P 500 closed at an all-time high Tuesday. The benchmark index notch. And why does it close at an all-time high? Why is it valued at that level? How long will it stay? What is your actual growth by the time you pay for fees and have volatility? What's your exit strategy? How do you get to this money? When do you get to this money? And what happens if it remains volatile in the future? What happens if you own a stock that goes out of business? If you're in the S&P 500, not all 500 companies are gonna be around 10 years from now because of artificial intelligence, advancement technology, and that we have a lot more you know, mobility with smaller companies that can grow exponentially. And there's a lot of major companies that it's very slow moving when they decide they need to make changes. So they have 
have, you know, uh, political policy to deal with. They have major, major movement to have to, you know, fire workers or hire workers. So I just think that there's a lot more going on than most people know. And we've just heard of so, many, so much corruption on reporting and all this kind of stuff. And we don't know what's going on in the boardrooms, but we're just supposed to trust and invest because that's the American thing to do. It's time to turn on your brain, ask some better questions, and determine how do you project your downside and is this really the right thing for you or is it just slowing you down from creating economic independence because most stocks don't create cash flow and cash flow is really the name of the game. A modest 0.2% gain to beat its previous record high set on February the 19th before the pandemic shut down businesses around the world and knocked economies to, into their worst recessions in decades. Well, that's an overstatement. It's not the worst recession. 2000 to 2015, one thing that's important to note is when we adjust for inflation, the stock market did 8.7% combined from 2000 to 2015. So that's what it's supposed to be doing per year. So yes, there are moments where we have big run-ups, like when we look at, you know, from 2012 for a few years, or we look at, you know, what's really happened in the last several years before 2020, absolutely. But Will it sustain? Is it sustainable? How could it be sustainable? Like, these are just questions I want you to be informed as you invest. In decades, it might be one of the shortest recessions in decades, but it's not the worst. A worse one is one that goes on and 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 on. We lost 40 million jobs, 20 million of them are already back to work. And some of the ones that aren't back to work don't want to be for different reasons right now, <laughs> because they're reasons. collecting so dad much That's money. By not working, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and with him, it was crazy that people are getting checks from the government that were bigger than if they actually went to work. That's not very incentivizing, but I also feel like if you find work that you enjoy, then that's even more confusing. But I know some people are just doing things they hate to do, so so uh, they make some good points here. So, you know, we got the government interference in our economy, and you see what happened with that. So, guys, good there point. are lessons to be learned in these kinds of things. There are spiritual lessons, there are emotional lessons, there are financial lessons, there are wealth-building lessons. And the lessons are, do you know what you're invested in? Have you discovered your investor DNA? What are your values? What do you pay attention to? What are your abilities or competencies that you have knowledge around? What are the things that drive you that you want to learn about? What if you invested in things that you knew and let everything else go so that you stayed more focused and diversified because diversification is diversification if you spread yourself thin or don't know what you're doing. And if you have multiple mutual funds, you might not even be diversified. You might be owning the same stocks. I just want to ask you the question, are there other investments out there other than the stock market? And if you're investing in it before you've paid off loans, which I know he's really big on paying off loans with Dave Ramsey, so it's, you know, he'd probably recommend paying off those loans first, or before you have enough liquidity, or if you're a business owner, before you fully invest in your business to make sure it's producing at the level that it deserves and you're not starving that off by taking money and putting it in a retirement plan that's locked up till 59 and a half, just some other questions to consider. And you've got to start looking at this stuff and go, really, where are we today? Yeah. And we kept saying, what did we say? We, Dr. John Deloney said, facts are your friends. Yep. You, do not, you do not make good decisions when you're drunk and when you're afraid. Hmm. Well, it's really... Yeah, that's, pretty, that's pretty good advice. Really ...important to remind yourself as you look at this and see this article um, and to hear this and to know it. And I think, you know, you, the lessons... That this guy's got a good voice, just saying. ...that we go through, we get a chance to learn from them. And when you apply wisdom, it becomes knowledge, right? And, and, and wisdom for yourself. But just hear this and understand it. And then start to grow and understanding this process of investing of what's going on. But for goodness sakes, don't rely on the media to give you your reality. Hmm. That's actually a really, really good point. You've got to keep your hand on the pulse and know what's going on. Well, the reality was the stock market was going down. Mm hmm but the, 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 what the media was telling you was that the world was coming to an end. Right. Mm -hmm. Chicken Little is here. The pandemic is going to ravage the planet. It is Ebola. Everyone's going to die. <laughs> Two million people are going to die. Uh, they don't teach math in med school, apparently. No. So there we go. And, you know, you ju it's just the whole. One of the things I want you to consider is, are they saying you're in it for the long haul? Because when does the long haul end? Or that, you know, you just got to stick with it regardless of what's happening, because that doesn't make sense either. There's a lot of notion around dollar cost averaging, which you just put money in every month, whether it goes up or down, and you'll buy it at an average price as time goes on. But why is it that U.S. Department of Labor says 95% of people are not economically independent at age 65? Yet we have, you know, 70-some million people 
contributing to 401ks, 401ks are not capable of providing the benefits and promises in retirement. Because if you put into it for 30 years, but then you're supposed to take out of it for 30 years, and you're only putting 10% of your income into it, if you're lucky, now that's somehow gonna replace your income after inflation, we've been lied to. And turning our brains off and handing our money over has not worked. It's time to invest back into yourself. It's time to question, just like we're talking about fake news and media and everything that Dave's talking about here, what is that in the stock market? What is that coming from Wall Street? And is that really where you want to put your money? The whole thing is, you know, uh, well, I'm so happy that these companies have recovered because that means the jobs are coming back and that means the folks that need a job and want a job and are willing to work are going to have a place to work. They, they have a place to go. Yeah, then, I agree. Once they get out of their home. Right. And yeah. uh, once their uh, economy starts to open up and so forth, I, I'm still... I'm in such a bubble because we've been back to work here with a thousand of us in this building for mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. We were off for about, we were off, we were working from home for about five weeks. And since then we've all been back. Mm -hmm. uh, we've not had a positive case in the building uh, since July the 19th. That's good. And uh, so about a month uh, and now. This is, he's being so much nicer in this video than the last video. So I, this is the Dave that I like. This is the Dave, you know, I may not agree with his assessment that it's the stock market's completely fine, but they, you know, the, at the same time, he's not like telling you it's gonna be this huge rate of return. He's just saying, don't make irrational decisions of fear or greed or when you're drunk. So that, you know, that's solid advice. Without a single positive case, out of a thousand people, we had 17, so 1.7% got the COVID flu at one time or another, zero deaths, right. and we're all at work. Um, and we're, you know, we're with each other every day. Our, our cafe is open. Um, well, I, I would just say that I like Dave a lot more from this video than previous videos. Um, you know, he makes some good points here that are worth listening to. And hopefully with some of my commentary, you can ask some questions that maybe weren't brought up so that hopefully you're more informed and more educated. Want to continue the path to be a better investor? Make sure that you're not losing money and taking too much risk? Well, click here and learn about strengths vesting.